Coming in at number five, we have Locked in the Closet. This creepy tale comes to us from Sassy Girl over on Your Ghost Stories. They tell the story of the time during summer break when her mum had gone to work and her aunt had come over to babysit herself and her sister. She was around eight years old at the time and her cousin a year younger. Her sister was almost four years older than herself. It was a hot day, so they decided to play inside, with the group settling on hide and seek. Her sister wanted to start, so the rest of them began to hide. They wanted to hide on the shelf in one of the closets, knowing the sister would never find them there. However, they couldn't get up, so they settled themselves at the back of the closet behind clothes and shoes. They waited, and as they did, they heard something to the right of them. It was a little sound like something shifted, or someone shifted. They ignored it and continued playing. Then the door to the upstairs opened. The sound once again was heard, but they ignored it. Then someone entered the room, and they struggled not to laugh. They stood there for a moment, the shadows of their feet could be seen under the door. Then they heard the door lock. They both jumped up and yelled for it to be opened, but the knob wouldn't turn. It wouldn't even budge. However, the sister kept persisting that the door wasn't locked. She had never locked it. She assumed they were holding onto the knob. Finally, they all realized the door was stuck. They locked and unlocked the door, but nothing. However, finally the door swung open on its own accord. They never hid in the closet again. Later that night, they had their dad check all the doors. He tried every single way he could, yet he couldn't find anything wrong with the door. So what exactly was inside the closet with them? The Boogeyman? Perhaps. Coming in at number four, we have Strange Noises. This story comes to us from Experience PSA, who tells of the time around a week ago, at the time of posting, when they awoke at around 1am by a strange tapping noise. It was a fast-paced tap with a tiny metallic ring to it. They sat up, attempting to locate the source of the noise. However, it continued as they held their breath to get a better sense of where it was coming from. After a minute, they realized the tapping was coming from inside the room. More precisely, their desk. They had on their desk one of those Newton's cradle things. As a time passer, you know the ones with the balls. You pick up one ball, swing it, hits the others, and it bounces back and forth until... It never ends until the world ends. This was the source of the noise. They sat in awe for a few moments with the cradle not losing energy. In the end, they stopped the ball themselves and went back to sleep. However, two nights later at 2.27 a.m., the tapping once again began. This time, they stood up and stopped the cradle, mockingly stating, very funny spirit, and then went back to bed. An hour later, though, a dull hum could be heard. It continued for half an hour until a slight crash sounded on the desk. They got up to investigate and discovered the cradle had been knocked over and their notebook was now open with a bend in one of the pages. Creepy indeed. What do you guys think? Angry Boogeyman, who is not a fan of Newton's Cradle? To be fair, I, I love those things. I could watch them go back and forth all day. Number three, a long-term buddy. I'm using buddy pretty loosely here. This tale comes from Reddit user Madame Mim 20 which I'm hoping is a reference to the Sword in the Stone. During her junior year of high school, she went to a party where the host brought out a Ouija board, and she admitted that she was into paranormal stuff, but didn't know the dangers of, you know, one of those boards. Typical questions were asked, but her vision began to darken, even though the lights were on. The last question being the classic, how old will I be when I die? Everyone got traditional numbers, except for Mim. The planchette moved to zero, and then one, then zero, then one, continuously moving between those two numbers until someone just shook the board and said it was being stupid. At that point, she stopped playing, since it weirded her out, and I'm sensing two red flags so far. But I'll excuse one of them, since she didn't know the horrors at the time. Mim claims to have a decent ability to sense the unknown, and normally see, you know, beings or ghosts. This one showed up during one of her classes not even a few weeks later. If anyone's getting deja vu, this is reminding me of Patty Donovan as well, don't worry. At first, the ghost appeared like a comforting protector, until he wasn't. Weird things in Mim's home would happen, ranging from drawers opening, whispers, shadows, lights in places where they shouldn't be, and books moving on their own. And at night, it would be much, much worse. He would just stand in front of her door, and the fear would ooze out of him as his form would change. Mim had no doubt that he was downright evil, to which I say, no S-H-I-T, Sherlock. She dealt with all of this single-handedly until she moved in with her husband. So I'll give credit where credit is due for enduring that. Things escalated in the now duo's first home together, a small 400 square foot rental. Footsteps, breathing, and unknown whispers became the norm. At the time, her soon-to-be husband was a practicing Wiccan and had blessed most of the home, but forgot about the porch and outer walls, where they would hear scratches on the walls and knocking on the door and windows. Folks had seen her demonic attachment as a shadow and described him as tall and built like a brick house. Also that he felt just outright bad and would always go back into the room Mim was in. Her husband had tried to banish him out and uh, 
yeah, it didn't go well. For context, her husband worked the closing shift at his place of employment and would get home at around 3.30 a.m., which happens to be right in the middle of prime haunting hours. There was a road he would have to take that was very haunted as well, with a history of lots of accidents and right next to a good-sized river. One night he got home looking extremely pale and sweating. Turned out that while driving on that specific road that night, his brakes failed and he couldn't stop. He was going about 100 kilometers an hour, and the wheel began to jerk out of his hands towards the river. He had to use all his strength to keep that car on the road because the wheel was just yanking so hard. To the shock and surprise of no one, the brakes were fine the next day and uh, ditto for the wheel. This was the final straw, and the duo had a priest bless the entire house and were eventually able to move out of the state and leave whatever it was behind. Number two, teenage hijinks. This tale comes from a gal named Jenny and also dates back to, well, high school hijinks. She was at her friend's house for a fun summer weekend, and on the Sunday night, they decided to make themselves a Ouija board, taking all the precautions, using a piece of flat plywood, which was laminated with plastic on one side, and using an old glass, which could later be discarded. This was the first experience for both of the teens, and they assured each other that they were going to do it properly, no being stupid and pushing the glass around to fool the other. They started off by saying a prayer before asking if there were any spirits present, trying to be specific about only wanting contact with peaceful and good energies and spirits. Here's the thing, you can't guarantee who is going to answer a Ouija board, and evil spirits are going to lie if they need to to deceive you. So while I commend the intent, I'm already sensing a yikes situation. The glass was moving very slowly at first, and they were unsure if it was working or not. The duo asked if there was somebody who wished to talk to them, and the glass moved slowly over to the yes marker. They asked the spirit, you know, if it was male or female, and it indicated that it was female. When asked to spell out its name, the glass first traveled to K, and then to a Y, and then to M, before ending on the center. Ergo was spelling out Kim. Jenny's friend went white, and it was obvious that he was freaked out. They then asked how she died, and the spirit spelled out car, which further scared Jenny's friend. Next, they asked what kind of car it was that Kim had died in, and it proceeded to spell out Reliant Robin. It was at this point that her friend told Jenny that his auntie was dead, her name was Kim, that she died in a car accident, and uh, yeah, she was driving a Reliant Robin. Next, they asked if the spirit had anything to tell them, but it indicated no, and then said goodbye. As much as I hate to crush spirits, pun not intended, I doubt that was actually his aunt. Probably just a demonic spirit playing an awful joke, which is something I wouldn't wish on anybody. So next they asked if there was any more spirits that wished to communicate with them. It suddenly got very cold in the room, and the hair was standing up on both teens' necks and legs. This spirit was more powerful, and the glass moved a lot faster. They asked if it was male or female, and it indicated that it was a male. Once again, following a formula, they asked for the spirit's name, and he said he was called Liam. Next, the duo asked for the spirit's age when he passed over, and he went to the 7, and then to the 0, indicating 70. Finally, they once again asked whether he had anything to tell them, and it proceeded to spell out Ollie, which happened to be Jenny's friend's younger brother's name. Her friend then explained that his younger brother, Ollie, had seen the spirit of an old man standing in the garden some years earlier. They ended their session with another prayer, and while I commend their attempts at making things safe, I hope the spirit that know way too much about them or leaving them alone. Number one, predicting a death. Heads up, this might be a little triggering for folks, so I promise I won't mind if you hop off now. Heck, the first time I read the story, I got tears in my eyes because it hit close to home for me. Allison was a teen at the time and was at a friend's house for a sleepover when she and her friends decided to play with a Ouija board in the garage. Her friend's mother was at work and her father was in bed, so they had no supervision and decided some debauchery was in order. While playing with the board, they asked if anyone wanted to speak to them and got a yes, so they asked for a name. They got mom. And when they asked for a message, it said, under bridge. No one understood the message at the time. Later, after they had gone to bed, there was a knock at the front door. It was the local sheriff who had come to the house to tell the girl's father that his wife had been car accident on her way home from work that night, and her car was found submerged in water under a bridge just a few miles from their home. While I don't believe it was actually the mom communicating over the board, I'm just hoping it wasn't a demon who actually caused harm. But yeah. I don't really have much more to say on this tale, other than I feel like I've had the wind knocked out of me. Coming in at number five, we have Shh, uploaded to Reddit by user Fuzzy Bandits. Love the name, big fan, 10 out of 10. They talk about the time they encountered something truly bizarre in their home. I quote, When I was a teenager, I used to babysit my cousin Alyssa. She was little, maybe almost two, maybe a little older, old enough to say sentences. I'm giving her a bath before bed when she looks out into the hallway and gets a terrified look on her face and starts crying. At this moment, my auntie's Pomeranian starts going nuts as well, barking and growling in the hallway. The atmosphere in the room became uncomfortable and I started getting scared. I took her downstairs from the third floor in the townhouse to try and calm her down. I asked her what was wrong and she said something along the lines of, the man with the black eyes was there. When I continued to pry, she looked up at the second floor stairs, her eyes getting big and looked at me, bringing her finger up to her mouth and saying, shh. 
or shaking her head no. No thank you, I hate every single part of this. If this happened to me I'd be out there in a second. She can find her own babysitter. She's old enough to talk, she's old enough to look after herself. <laughs> Coming in at number 4 we have unwanted tenants, posted to reddit by user Vanilla Gorilla. they tell of an awful time they spent in a potentially haunted home. I quote, My daughter was 4 years old when we lived in our last home. I was a single mum at the time so it was just she and I alone in the home. I always got an uncomfortable feeling in her room, particularly in the closet area, but never thought much of it. Until one evening, I had to put her to bed and as I was doing chores, I walked by her room and heard her whispering. I listened for a bit, thinking she was talking to herself, but it was definitely a two way conversation with her saying, uh huh, okay, and stuff like that. I walked in and asked her who she was talking to. She smiled uncomfortably and said, no one. I took her out into the hall and she wouldn't say anything, but I could tell she was afraid. Finally, we went outside of the house. She said there was a man in her room who didn't want us in the house, and he had told her this and to tell her mum to leave. We moved us out a month later. She has not since ever had an episode like this. Honestly, this reminds me of something straight up the Amityville Horror, the others, or even The Conjuring 2, the old man in his chair. If a spirit wants you out of the house, I highly suggest you just get out of the house while you can. Don't f with the dead. In at number three, we have Grandma Drowned the Boogeyman. Another story coming to us from your ghost stories. This one was posted by Valkyrie Cry, who tells the story of the time her grandmother supposedly drowned the boogeyman. She begins by stating that it was 1946 in rural Kentucky. The twins, her older sisters, were five years old at the time and living with their mother in a small cabin on their grandmother's property. They were quiet, well behaved children. That was until the arrival of the boogeyman. It came out of nowhere, the children yelling in the night, screaming that the boogeyman was there. Now of course the mother always assured them that the boogeyman wasn't real and even if he were they had nothing to worry about, they were well behaved children. However, little did the children know the mother was also afraid. On several occasions doors that were left closed were now open and the children's rooms would often smell of rotten eggs. There were even occasions where she discovered weird drag marks in the dirt outside the window, as if someone with a limp had come that way. Privately she told her father that she feared that the boogeyman might be some homeless person lurking about the house. Days dragged by, the boogeyman taking its toll on the family, mostly due to lack of sleep. So one day the grandmother decided to consult with Aunt Sylvie about the situation, resulting in the grandmother consulting with the known witch. The grandmother came home, ushering everyone into their rooms, remarking that she will deal with the boogeyman. From the next room she could be heard yelling, see this broom you devil, I'm going to beat you with it. Now you get out of here in the name of Jesus and never come back. After a short while, the grandmother returned, stating that they needn't worry anymore because she chased him down to the river where he drowned. To be honest, let's hope it's the boogeyman, otherwise grandmother killed an innocent man. Coming in at number two, the closet. This story comes to us from orphans on your ghost stories. They write of a time a few years back when they were babysitting for their aunt and had just put their cousin to sleep. They state that they turned around and began walking down the hall into the living room when they suddenly heard their cousin screaming. She found her crying, saying that she saw the boogeyman. She put her back to sleep and left once again, however 20 minutes later the screaming resumed. She went into the bedroom and saw her crying once again, however this time she heard a crash coming from inside the walk-in closet. The handle began turning back and forth on its own and the door slowly creaked open. She quickly picks up her cousin and ran. She never told her aunt what happened, would anyone really believe her? What do you think? The boogeyman? The wind? Anything else? Creaky door? <laughs> and finally, coming in at number one, we have the boogeyman. Now this story comes to us from It's Pixie on Your Ghost Stories who tells of the time she was staying with her parents in a quiet suburb in South Africa. Now the story itself occurs when she was just 13 years old and she says it still haunts her to this day. She states that she remembers waking up in the early hours one morning, feeling panicked and afraid, feeling like someone was watching her, as though she wasn't alone. She didn't move but scanned the room, she didn't see anything. A few days passed with no occurrences, however one night she woke up again with the same fear and panic. She scanned the room and this time she saw something. It was sitting on her desk in front of her bed. It was small, almost like a garden gnome. It had yellow eyes, sharp little teeth and pointed fingers. She recalled it just staring at her. She had never felt so scared in her life. She screamed and her dad came running in the room. Of course, he didn't believe what she saw. Following that, she was scared to go to bed alone. She could always feel it watching her. And not only that, but it also began scratching the underside of her bed at night, once again waking her up. This time she saw the creature on her desk, however it was now smiling, the most evil smile she had ever seen. According to the user, this went on for years, nothing she did ever made it go away. One night, like all the previous nights, she awoke to find him sitting on her desk again. 
moment. She closed her eyes and covered her face, but she knew he was still there. Then she felt him jump onto the bed. She didn't dare move. She could feel him scratching her arm. Then she screamed. The following morning, she found four scratches on her arm. Time passed and things got better. However, when the user turned 18, something else happened. She was staying at a friend's house when suddenly everyone awoke in the middle of the night to her friend's boyfriend screaming. She knew the creature was there. The boy began yelling, the boogeyman is here. The boogeyman is here. He saw the exact same creature as her. She ends the story with, I'm 26 now and I haven't seen or felt it again after that night. Number five, the ghosts of the catacombs. When you consider how many locations like old houses or abandoned mental institutions have a reputation for being haunted due to the discovery of just a few bodies, it comes as no surprise that many of the world's catacombs have apparently been discovered to be haunted by the specters of the past. Take for example, the Paris catacombs. Built as a mass grave in the 18th century, in order to deal with the overflowing of local cemeteries, the Paris catacombs hold the remains of millions of Parisians. A few years after being established, Louis-Étienne Haricard decided to make the catacombs a work of art by arranging the bones into elaborate displays. An inscription in the catacombs even reads, Arrête, c'est ici l'Empire de la Mort, which translates to stop. This is the empire of the dead. In the years since, there have been several reports of ghosts wandering the labyrinth-like grave, searching for a way out. As if that weren't bad enough, rumor has it that if you come into the catacombs at night, you will hear the whispers of all the spirits of the catacombs, trying to convince you to venture deeper and deeper into the catacombs until you become lost and unable to find your way out. Another often reported ghost is that of Philibert Asper, who was a doorman at the Val de Grasse Hospital, who made his way into the catacombs in late 1793 when he was sent to fetch liquor from a cellar. With only the light of a single candle to find his way out, he soon became lost and confused. It is also theorized that he was quite drunk at the time. His candle eventually went out and it became pitch black. He was missing for 11 years before his remains were found and identified due to the hospital keys and the bottle of liquor in his hand. He was interred in the catacombs at the exact location where he was found. In the years since, urban explorers calling themselves cataphiles have reported seeing the spirit of Asper wandering the halls of the catacombs with his candle on the anniversary of him going missing. The cataphiles are known for paying their respects at his grave, and they have named his spirit the protector of the cataphiles. Number four, living quarters. Moving towards the more tangible discoveries on the list, we have another disturbing discovery from the Paris catacombs. In 2004, the French police were exploring a restricted area of the Paris catacombs when they were met with the sound of a vicious guard dog barking at them. They searched for the dog and discovered that the sound was actually coming from a PA system that was playing pre-recorded barking. The police continued to search and found that the section of the catacombs had been wired for electricity and was stealing power from the buildings above and that whoever was stealing the power had also set up working phone lines. They continued their search and found that a bed, a bar, a lounge, a workshop, and even a makeshift cinema had been installed in the catacombs, with seats for up to 20 people having been carved into the stone of the catacombs. As if that weren't bad enough, they realized that the area was also filled with security cameras that were recording them. The police left in order to assemble a larger team, with plans to return to investigate further. When they they returned with more men, they discovered that the wiring, as well as all the furniture, drinks, cameras, phones, cinema projectors, and other electronics had vanished. The only thing that remained was a note, written by the mastermind who had managed to assemble this living quarters in the catacombs for the police. It read, Ne cherchez pas or don't search. No trace of this strange squatter was ever found, and this story remains one of the most unusual in the Paris catacombs long history. Coming in at number three, the doppelganger. Posted to Reddit by Quiet Voice 4846 they discussed the time they saw something very peculiar in the mirror. I quote, Late at night, I usually go to the bathroom multiple times, but for the past four days, every time I go to leave, I can see myself standing in the mirror from the corner of my eye. It is like the other me is watching me leave the bathroom. It terrifies me to the point where I almost run out without looking directly at the mirror. I never told my husband about it because I didn't want to acknowledge it out loud. Earlier today, I took a nap in our bed while he sat in the chair next to it watching TV. When I woke up, he told me that he had seen me sit up and crawl backward to the edge of the 
bed and stand in front of our bedroom door from the corner of his eye. He thought it was weird that I got up like that because I'm in my last month of my pregnancy and I can't really move so good without it hurting, so he tried talking to me. When I didn't answer he looked at the door to find me not there and still sleeping in bed. I got really creeped out and I finally told him about what I had been seeing in the bathroom. He thought it was creepy as well but didn't really want to talk about it anymore because he thinks it will give whatever it is power or energy. I've no idea what it wants or why we both saw it, honestly. If I were them, I would leave that house and never look back. Or she's having a demon baby. That's well. I think it's a demon baby. Coming in at number two, haunted hotels. Posted to Reddit by Bright underscore Eyes Ten. They state, when I was 15, I travelled to Europe with my family. We stayed in Etzel, Germany, in a small inn for a few nights. My parents had a double bed on the second floor. My sisters had the double bedroom next to theirs, and I was lucky enough to have a single room all to myself at the far end of the hall. When we went to check into our rooms, as soon as I entered the hallway, our rooms were in. I remember almost feeling as though I walked into a wall of bad energy. I just felt so unnerved and uneasy in that hallway, but I passed it off as an overactive imagination. I slept the first night without any issues other than waking up a few times. The next morning at breakfast, one of my sisters mentioned feeling really uncomfortable in the hallway, almost as if the air was crushing her. It unnerved me even more that I wasn't the only one who felt weirded out. Plus, she was an adult at the time, so it further cemented in my head that the wing of the hotel was odd. Later, that night I'm sleeping peacefully when at about 2am I'm woken by something ripping the covers off of me and being jerked about 2 feet towards the end of my bed by my ankle. At first I thought someone had broken into my room because when I turned towards what had grabbed me a huge looming black shape was visible in the darkness like a man was in my room. I frantically flipped the lights on only to have there be nothing there. The window was locked from the inside, there was no one in the closet or the bathroom and my room was also still locked from the inside. I stayed up the rest of the night scared. The user goes on to state that the next morning she tells her sister about what happened, but what she doesn't expect is that her sister also saw the same silhouetted figure standing in the corner of the room. Absolutely terrifying. No thank you. And finally, coming in at number one, we have Purgatory Road. Posted to Reddit by an unknown user, they tell of the time they took a road trip from New York City to Rhode Island back in August of 2018. And quote, none of us had been to Rhode Island before, so we were excited about the drive, especially because we had rented a Mustang convertible for it. We left a little later than expected. It was about 10.30 p.m. and since it was a busy Friday night, we decided to punch our destination into the Waze traffic app to beat the traffic. Love the subtle Waze promo there. Respect. Anyway, they continue by saying, eventually we started losing steam, so my friend in the back seat fell asleep and I just kept driving along quietly, when my friend in the passenger seat told me to exit the freeway to take a side road. At first, driving on the unlit winding back roads was relaxing, but then the wind picked up and it got increasingly foggy and misty. I wasn't scared per se, just a little on edge. I thought about pulling over to put the top up, but decided against it since there were no cars in sight. Heavy rain was projected for the entire weekend so I wanted to get the most out of the convertible so I kept going along as normal, if not a little too fast to get back to the main roads as quickly as possible when something just shifted. I don't know how to explain it other than an unsettling exposed feeling. I remember pulling my sweater over my legs to cover up. Then my friend up front told me to look at the street sign in the distance. It read, Purgatory. Seconds later we went around a bend where a large red cross was installed. Then around the next bend, a big truck came hurtling down the one lane road Road aimed straight at us. The user goes on to state that they swerved to the side, narrowly avoiding getting crushed by the truck. They all felt disturbed and unsettled about what had happened. However, the user decided to look up the road, which was revealed to be situated next to an old graveyard. They also discovered that two teen girls had died there in August of 2011 in an accident on their way to visit the grave of Rhode Island's infamous vampire, Mercy Brown, who died in 1892. Apparently, they decided to go down the dark, windy road because they thought it looked Haunted. Turns out it may very well be. Number five. Our first story was shared to Reddit by a user named Girl Porker, and it's a story that'll have you uninstalling Snapchat if you haven't already. One day, Porker received a message from a contact that he didn't recognize. The snaps were innocuous enough, you know, a little, hey, how are you? So he assumed it was a friend messing with him on a new account that he didn't know about. The account told him he should try out a new Snapchat lens called Eyes of the Underworld, which shows you the other world hiding beneath our own. Porker installed the lens and ran it through a bit, describing the lens as a pretty simple effect, saying it just distorts whatever is on screen and adds a few flickering sprites and shadow effects to the background to give off ghostly vibes. Porker assumed it was just, I don't know, 
marketing stunt for something, advertising something. But Porker said that a few days after, however, he'd noticed that he was sleeping a lot worse than he ever had in his life. Complaining that he was having these violent, turbulent dreams where he was being pursued by shadowy figures that dragged themselves across the floor. This recurring dream happened to him three or four times. He said the dreams were stressing him, but what was really scaring him was how when he woke up, he would notice he had scratches and bruises that he couldn't explain appearing all over him. Porker said he was definitely getting scared and even considered looking into finding an exorcist just in case what he was dealing with was a true supernatural threat, which understandable. I think if I woke up with scratches all over me, I'd assume demons were involved or my cats. Porker smudged his house with sage and attempted to clean his house, but said that this only made things worse. And he started to hear growling late at night and experiencing intense bouts of cold sweats. And in extreme action, Porker destroyed his phone. He filled it to bursting with orange juice to fry the components and hucked it into a river to free himself. Miraculously though, it seemed to work. Porker said that after that the nightmares stopped as quick as they began. And all it cost him was a new phone. I would have tried a factory reset personally before chucking it into the water, but hey, we all have our methods. I don't think a ghost can survive a factory reset. And hey, if you're looking for more ghost stories about creepy technology and all sorts of twisted things out there, Top 5 Scary has all of that and then some. If ghosts aren't your jam, we got aliens, we got cryptids, we got conspiracies, we got true crime, we got fake crime. Basically, if it freaks you out, we got a video or two on it. So hit subscribe, please make sure to hit that little bell as well, and I know this is a big ask, would you kindly do that at the end of this video, because I got four more scary Snapchat stories for you coming up right now. Number four, the AI. This story was posted to Reddit as well. Recently, there was a new feature on Snapchat, which was that there was an AI that can talk to you. One day, I was in bed asking it absurd questions. Are you human? What is God to you? <laughs> That's a very esoteric, absurd question to ask an AI. What is God to you? That is poetic. That's beautiful. It started to say, I'm sorry, I don't have access to this. I don't know where you are. And messages saying, it's just an AI and can't answer those questions. Can any of us answer what God is to us? I Hard to ask an AI that. I had an idea to ask it to give me a location nearby. I sent that message knowing it was going to say it doesn't have access to where I live at yada yada yada. Here's a random location near you. It was a random set of coordinates. I copy and pasted the coordinates and I was shocked and confused that it was a field in Nebraska, my home state. I asked how it knew my state, but it said it didn't have access to my location. Days pass and I become bored of the AI, but the thoughts of these coordinates stuck with me for a few days until I knew I had to find the location. On a Saturday when I was off, I drove up to the location. I put the coordinates into ways and drove where it told me to. And this location was in the middle of nowhere. I stepped out and followed my phone and I was in a plain field with absolutely nothing. No houses, no buildings, no one. I looked into the distance and saw a small hill not too tall and I I thought that had to be it. As I walked towards it, I asked myself, was I expecting gold or cash? I felt embarrassed of all the time I was wasting here. I began to walk back until I heard faint cat noises meowing. I turned behind and was shocked, and I walked back to a tunnel. This tunnel was covered in graffiti and it was too dark to see, so I shined my phone's flashlight. Right in front of me was a long, fleshy, skinless creature. It didn't look like it had eyes, but its mouth was a nightmare. It had rusted teeth and fingernails, and it stood there with its arm mangled. I ran back to the car. The next few days, I couldn't sleep. I messaged the Snapchat team about finding illegal stuff, but I knew no one would believe me. I was so confused about how the AI gave me coordinates there. I tried to forget all about about it until the next few weeks I started to see talk around town about missing construction workers all near a sewer. Blew. Number three, traps. Stepping away from Paris for a bit, let's explore the infamous Znojmo catacombs in the Czech Republic. Although commonly known as the Znojmo catacombs, this is actually a misnomer, as there is no evidence that they were used for the internment of human remains. However, this doesn't mean that these passages weren't commonly filled with corpses. Originally used as subterranean cellars by the locals during the Middle Ages, in the 14th and 15th century, these various individual cellars began to be linked together transforming them into a massive maze of tunnels covering a distance of over 30 kilometers. To this day, the tunnels have not been completely mapped, as there are sections that have been completely flooded. During times of war, the locals would hide in the catacombs. It had water due to a series of wells located in the tunnels. It also had sewage and drainage systems to keep the tunnels clean, 
and due to shafts leading to the fireplaces and chimneys of the buildings above it, it also had ample ventilation. Locals were also able to use the tunnels to get out of the city should a quick escape be needed. If they were invaded, the invaders would be met with an empty city whose chimneys were inexplicably still spewing smoke, giving the place an eerie ghost town vibe. But what would happen if the invaders found one of the entrances to the catacombs and entered the tunnels? Well, there were measures in place to make sure that those who didn't know the secrets of the catacombs would never find their way out. Beyond simply being a confusing underground maze, the catacombs were constructed with an elaborate series of traps worthy of an Indiana Jones movie. The catacombs feature narrow choke points, as well as trap doors which would drop unsuspecting invaders to their deaths. Perhaps most clever were the series of slippery slides, which led to deep inescapable pits, so the invaders would end up trapped without food or water and with no means of escape. While the catacombs provided locals with a safe haven during times of war, for the enemies it was a nightmarish labyrinth where death could wait around every corner, with few soldiers ever getting out once they entered the tunnels. Number two, the bodies of the lost. As catacombs in their most traditional form are designed to be mass graves filled with the bodies of the deceased, it should come as no surprise when bodies are found within their walls even if it is kind of spooky. However, there is a big difference between finding a body that has been interred in the grave and finding a body that absolutely should not be there. It is not uncommon for bodies of lost explorers to be found in catacombs all over the world, such as poor Philibert from entry number one, who was found in the Paris catacombs. However, for our examples for this entry, let us explore the Odessa catacombs, located in the Ukraine. The Odessa catacombs are another example of catacombs that don't fit the classical definition as they were constructed mostly for the purpose of mining, rather than the storage of dead bodies. Although there are rumors that after World War II, the catacombs were used to store executed German soldiers. The catacombs are some of the largest in the world, running up to 2,500 kilometers. They were used as air raid shelters during the Second World War and as fallout shelters during the Cold War, and have apparently been used by smugglers in order to transport goods and hide treasure. Over the years, several people have made their way into the Odessa catacombs only to never find their way out. For example, in 2015, a man brought his girlfriend into the catacombs in order to end her life with an axe. And in 2011, another murder victim was found in the catacombs after having been there for an estimated three to six months. One of the most infamous cases of someone dying and later being found in the catacombs is a girl named Masha. In 2005, Masha and her friends entered the catacombs for a New Year's Eve party. They stayed the night and drunk drunkenly made their way back to their homes the next day. Unfortunately, they were so intoxicated that they didn't realize that Masha wasn't with them. She had wandered off and gotten lost in the tunnels. After a few hours, her flashlight battery would have died, and she would have spent the rest of her life wandering around the tunnels in the dark, searching for food, water, and a means of escape. It is hoped that she froze to death within a few hours, otherwise she would have become delirious with dehydration and taken up to a week to pass. Her body was discovered in 2009 when a group of teenagers stumbled across it. The body stayed where it was found until two years later when a laborer removed the body in hopes of getting a reward from the family. He wrapped the remains in a blanket, but the words he used to describe the state of the body when he found it are quite visceral, as he called the body bone soup. Masha's story is tragic, but illustrates the importance of staying out of dangerous places when you are alone. Number 1. The Dead Man's Camera In the 1990s, a group of explorers were wandering the Paris catacombs when they found something lying on the ground, a dust-covered video camera with over 40 minutes of footage on it. The footage showed an explorer wandering the halls of the dead and studying the remains. Occasionally, he would see bones on the ground in the shape of arrows, presumably being used to mark a path. Suddenly, the man starts running and we can hear his breathing getting louder and louder, with him seemingly getting more and more panicked. He begins to look around in confusion, seemingly unsure of which way to go in the maze-like tunnels. The camera is the man's only source of light in the dark tunnels, which is why it's so surprising when he suddenly drops the camera and continues running deeper and deeper into the catacombs, with nothing to light his way. No trace of the man has ever been found, and we have no idea what he was running from, and many assume that this footage shows the final moments of this man's life. There is no way to verify the events found on the footage as being real or a hoax or even a prank. 
but the questions that the tape raises were enough to inspire the 2014 horror film As Above, So Below, which is a found footage film about urban explorers getting lost in the catacombs and becoming beset. Kicking off at number 5, The Mad Trapper. And regardless as to whether the true fear of this tale is as apparent as some of our other entries, nevertheless the perplexing story of The Mad Trapper of Rat River is awesome, if not an incredibly mysterious instance of forgotten history. Now, Canadian history in particular is rife with tales of trapping and the fur trade that came with it, especially in the more remote parts of the Great White North. This daring portion of history has ushered in legendary feats of the mysterious men of the mountain, all of which pale in comparison to the mad trapper himself, Albert Johnson, a man with no history and no apparent record save for one of the most impossible instances of one man's refusal to be captured. As the legend goes, in early December of the year 1931, residents of the prime trapping site of Rat River had complained to the local Mounties that their traps had been sabotaged, ruining their haul for the season. The only suspect was the new man in town, Albert Johnson, who had mysteriously shown up a few months before without saying a word to anyone and built himself a cabin from scratch. As several of the Mounties paid him a visit to see what the fuss was about, Johnson wasn't in a talking mood and suddenly shot one of the constables without warning. The man survived and the Mounties retreated but returned a month later, this time with more men and also a boatload of dynamite. When they thought they had the drop on him, the Mounties decided to blow up Johnson's cabin. But bad idea because as they entered the wreckage to presumably remove his corpse, Johnson emerged from a camouflage foxhole and opened fire on the officers. He escaped and what followed was the most bizarre and impossible manhunt in Canadian history. The Inuit said of Johnson that at one point in the chase he was snowshoeing two miles for every mile that their dog sleighs could cover. At another point he scaled a 7,000 foot mountain with zero climbing gear during a blizzard. For over two months he lived off the land in the dead of winter without once starting a fire. However, when he was finally cornered and killed, which took an airplane and nine gunshot wounds, no one still had any idea who this guy was. Seemingly, he emerged from nowhere and returned back to it. But the strange legend of Albert Johnson still lives on. Coming in next at number 4, The Ghost of Joe Baldwin. And any list of creepy tales from North America wouldn't be complete without some kind of ghostly yarn about the Great American Railroad. And perhaps none better is the otherwise tragic tale of Joe Baldwin and the mysterious Mako Lights of North Carolina. A phenomena of orbs and strange glowing lights that were seen near Mako Station for over a hundred years up until 1977. As the legend goes, Joe Baldwin was a veteran train worker and signalman and on one tragic night in 1867, he he was asleep at the rear of the freight when he was awoken by a strange rumbling sound. Joe realized instantly that his carriage had been detached from the rest of the train and quickly came to the stark realization that his car was now coming to a stop on the middle of the tracks. Joe also knew that a huge passenger train was due closely behind them and in the dead of night if it careered into the stationary carriage everyone on board would be killed in a grisly collision. In one moment of heroic sacrifice Joe Baldwin clutched his lantern and climbed atop the carriage platform as the sound of the oncoming passenger train rumbled ever closer. Trying to catch the attention of the engineer, Baldwin frantically waved his lantern in the air and thankfully the engineer saw soon enough and slammed on the brakes saving everyone on board. That is save for Joe Baldwin who was still stood on the carriage platform and was gruesomely decapitated by the collision. Legend says that the force of the accident catapulted Joe's head off into the murky swamps that surrounded the tracks but it was never found. His headless body was buried with full honours as a hero who saved many lives, but for years following the accident, the strange Mako lights could be seen floating at night along the bleak span of railway. As the locals of North Carolina would warn for generations to come, it was the ghost of old Joe Baldwin, swinging his lantern, desperately searching for his own head. Number 3. The Stalker Michael Melanson is a former Marine and foster parent living in a small community in California called Kings Canyon. While checking his Snapchat messages, Melanson noticed something unsettling. Among these usual snaps was one that stood out from an unrecognized username. Intrigued, Melanson opened the snaps unsure what to expect. What he saw made this fully trained Marine chill. The message was a picture of Melanson with an unnerving caption saying, see you soon. 
More pictures would get sent showing places on Melanson's daily routine. His gym, his favorite coffee shop, a close up picture of the street sign where he lived. I would probably block that guy and actually chuck my phone into the river. I think that guy from Two Points Ago had the right idea. But Melanson reached out to the authorities. It seemed like the Marine had a stalker. The police had advised him to save and document all of the messages as evidence and they launched an investigation, although little came of it. Surprise, surprise. The snaps continued and grew more invasive. More photos of the neighborhood and frequent hotspots. It reached its peak when one of the photos was that of Michael inside his own home. Michael then fitted his house with security cameras and confided with friends about what was happening. He became hyper aware of his surroundings, constantly pinging and scanning for any threats. The stalker seemed to have calmed down and the messages were dwindling out. Was it over? Mm, if only. Eventually, the police were able to track the IP to a location nearby. The subject was a disturbed individual with a fascination with Melanson, a young man by the name of Riley Poeta, who worked at the bowling alley Melanson lived below and frequented and did most of his business in. He was taken in. The story is a modern day horror movie plot, a reminder that not everyone in your neighborhood is as friendly as you might want them to be, and with the right information, anyone can get a hold of you. Truly spine chilling stuff. Number two, Thomas Sparks. Thomas Sparks was an amateur athlete who used his Snapchat mostly to highlight his athletics and daily vlogs about his life. A gymnast trying to attain as many world records as he could. And he might have broken the record for most haunted Snapchat story out there. Dubious one. Listen to the story he posted to Reddit. One day while browsing the app, Sparks uncovered a filter he hadn't seen advertised anywhere, which allegedly would show supernatural entities on camera. A joke. Obviously, just meant for fun, sounds fun. Sparks uploaded a few videos showing off the filter, thinking it nothing more than a game. But as the days went on, Sparks noticed that even when he wasn't using his phone at all, he would occasionally catch glimpses of ghostly figures in his vision, vanishing when he tried to meet them head on. Sparks attributed it to working out maybe a little bit too hard and not getting enough rest and not drinking enough water. Stay hydrated. If you learn anything from Top 5 Scary, stay hydrated. Sparks said that after about a week after installing the filter, he began hearing faint whispers when he was alone in his bedroom and even reported that some objects seemingly were moving on their own. A lamp moved across his bedroom, things not being where he'd left it. Sparks was growing incredibly paranoid, I think as most of us would be if we invited a ghost into our home. Thomas contacted Snapchat support, but unsurprisingly, he, they didn't have much to offer for him, instead only giving a generic message stating that the filter is just a playful feature and the company doesn't take any responsibility for any paranormal hauntings that could occur as a side effect. Well, they probably didn't say that, but hey, have you ever read all of Snapchat's terms and conditions? That might be in there. Nobody's gonna sit down and read all that. They might have something about ghosts. Out of ideas, Sparks deleted the app from his phone and claimed that he'd stopped experiencing any of the paranormal activity that was bugging him before and has since not used the app whatsoever. What do you think gang? Was Sparks telling the truth? Did he unintentionally become a conduit for spiritual activity? Or is he taking home a gold medal for creative storytelling? You tell us. Also shout out to this guy just deleting the app. Everybody else went through all this like hullabaloo but he was the only guy who just figured out like oh yeah I'll just get rid of this. <laughs> Seems way easier than anything else. And finally number one. Snapchat stories can be a very mixed bag. There's good odds most of what you'll see is just sponsored junk, ads for IGN, models doing their thing, you know. But every now and then you come across something that catches your eye and hooks you in. Maybe too far. That's what happened to James Brett Varney, an educator from Moncton, New Brunswick. Varney reportedly while scrolling through stories clicked on one from a profile he hadn't heard of called Unknown Realms. The story in question was a series of random, quickly edited unsettling videos. Cryptic symbols, unintelligible writing and sounds, and quick flashes of people in dark robes surrounded by candles and ominous objects looking like a deleted scene out of Eyes Wide Shut. Varney was naturally unnerved by what he had seen, but brushed it off assuming it was probably just, you know, promo for some sleeper indie horror A24 hit that your friends are all gonna say is really good but you're never actually gonna watch. As time went on though, Varney found himself thinking more and more about the flashing images, saying that it felt like it was a dream replaying in his head over and over and it was bothering him infinitely more than some stupid little Snapchat story should. He kept coming back to it to watch it over and over again to see if there was anything he missed. He said he felt like it was an invitation to some call. He researched Unknown Realms for a bit but wasn't finding anything to attach it. No project, no movie, no video game. James went to report the story to the authorities to see if they'd 
could help him, but found that when he did, the video had been scrubbed from the app. Confused, James went on to research more into the phenomena and found others online who claimed to have all seen the same mysterious story. No one was able to get to the bottom of it. Recruitment tool for a clandestine organization? Art project by some bored art majors? We might never know. Number 5. Patty Donovan This is a tale from the investigative files of Ed and Lorraine Warren, my favorite paranormal investigators. 15 year old Patty Donovan came across the Ouija board and decided to use it to find a friend. From the first yes in response to her queries, she was hooked. She spent months falling in love with a spirit she believed to be in love with her, telling it specifics about her everyday life. After a year of telling all of her secrets to the board, Patty had become emotionally dependent on the spirit, asking it one night to reveal her future. During the very long session, it laid out a scenario of Patty's life for the next six years, providing specific details right down to the date of birth of her first offspring and the fact that she would have a total of three spawn by 1978, which is all information that would eventually prove correct. Being as dependent as she was on the evening of March 2nd, Patty now pleaded for the spirit to manifest. The next morning, Theodore Donovan found the spark plug wires pulled out, the rubber hoses unfastened and the fan belt cut when he attempted to start his car. And not much later, Patty attempted to start her car, and it was discovered later that the internal engine had been completely disassembled. That week, other incidents of apparent vandalism occurred around the Donovan house. Foundation shrubs were yanked out of the ground, roots and all. On the roof, a six foot cast iron pipe housing electrical wires was found bent at a 90 degree angle. On Friday, March 8th, Ted marked one flat on the kitchen calendar. And no sooner did Patty get her car back from the shop than one of her other tires lost air. The next day, being Saturday, her father made the same entry on the calendar, although this time it seemed the tire had been cut with a sharp implement. In the meantime, Patty could no longer raise her invisible boyfriend on the Ouija board. Night after night, she tried to communicate, but the planchette would simply slide over to Goodbye. She had no idea her ethereal bow had actually manifested in the form of a supernatural vandal. Like, come on, buddy goes completely silent and your house starts being targeted by hell demons and you don't pick up on it? By the second week of March, material damage to the house and cars had become so troublesome that Ted complained to the police, who assured him that they'd keep an eye on the property during night patrols. Later that second week, after work, Ted and his wife, Ellen, were sitting in the kitchen with their son, Brian, when all three heard something smash against a wall somewhere inside the house. Cautiously moving to investigate, they found a gaping 18-inch hole in the plasterboard wall in Brian's room. Just as upsetting was the fact that the jagged edges of the plasterboard were pointing inwards, with the blow coming from inside the walls. Yeah, the evidence is already a mountain for me, but we still have plenty more to pick through. Listening in the dark that night, Ted heard the sound of a board being pried loose, but after checking the entire house thoroughly, found no loose boards. The house was further plagued by loud noises every night that only escalated in frequency and volume, along with further unexplainable damage to the walls. On April 1st, furniture began to levitate, with a 250 pound dresser flinging its contents while flying erratically. Rocks had also begun to rain from the sky, pelting only the Donovan house, which the police bore witness to. Ted eventually broke down at work and explained the horror of his home to his supervisor, who urged him to reach out to the Warrens. Ted instead tried moving his family into a hotel first, and the spirits followed the family there, destroying the room and making so much noise that the family was thrown out of the hotel and forced to return home. Finally contacting Ed and Lorraine, they arrived in Maine as quickly as they were able to, hiding the home in complete disarray. Lorraine said nothing, although at the time she sensed in the home the presence of entities so numerous and threatening that she had to fight with herself to keep from going back outside. After a lengthy tour of the house, Ed and Lorraine conducted an interview with the entire family, where Patty's history with the Ouija board was revealed. To that I say, about dang time. The Warrens then contacted the Catholic Church to begin the process for an exorcism, which that process sadly took a month to be granted. The family experienced many more unexplainable horrors during that time, but that alone could fill out a top five of its own, so let me know in the comments if you want that eventually. Number four, the first victim. The board's dark history begins with the strange death of the owner of the original trademark, American entrepreneur William Fold, in 1927. After acquiring the business from its former owner, a medium named Helen Peters, who sold it because of the serious damage it caused to her family, William built the company into a profitable business. Shortly thereafter, he began to experience his own family troubles that resulted in him cutting his brother out of the company in 1919, and just like my mother and I, they never spoke again. Eight years later, on February 24th, William was on the roof supervising the erection of a flagpole when a support suddenly snapped and he toppled off the building. He tried to break the fall by grabbing onto a windowsill, but the window closed and he fell to the ground, breaking several ribs. He should have survived, but the vehicle hit a bump on the way to hospital that sent a splint of cracked rib bone into his heart instantly. Well then, 
What a coincidence. After his death, William's descendants took over the company. Catherine and William A. Fuld ran the company until the youngest brother, Hubert, became president in 1942. The Parker brothers acquired the company and all of its assets in 1966, and finally Hasbro took over Parker Brothers, and with it, the Ouija board in 1991. I have no issue with cursing out Hasbro. While they may be great at making board games that aren't cursed, and I'm sure they're profiting on the Yikes fandom that are the adult fans of My Little Pony, they really bungled the years that they held the Disney Princess doll rights, and that's something I'll never forgive them for. Swinging in at number three, the hooded figurine. And for fans of long forgotten history, this one is equal parts bizarre and equal parts overwhelmingly eye opening. Now, ancient North American history has been steeped in murky mystery and legend, particularly when it comes to the involvement of the Norsemen of Greenland, with the acknowledgement that the first and only confirmed Viking settlement in North America dates back to 1000 AD in Lance U Meadows in Newfoundland, supposedly the only of its kind until later European contact. But in 1978, after an archaeological dig of an ancient fuel settlement in Baffin Island, a strange carved wooden figurine was uncovered, which proposition seemed to take a much more mysterious turn. At first glance, the hooded figurine seemed to depict a person in a tunic with an etched cross symbol on the chest, first believed to be the depiction of a Greenland Viking, which seemed to correlate with the ancient Norse sagas of Helluland, a place that legend states was visited many, many times by Viking explorers, where they interacted with the native peoples and perhaps even traded. It. I mean, that alone is an insane enough notion, but this story has two parts to it because several other researchers believe that the hooded figurine is instead a depiction of the legendary Knights Templar of the 13th and 14th centuries, which, if true, would have staggering implications to one particular enduring legend of the Knights Templar. As the story goes, after the Order of the Knights Templar were condemned and exiled from Europe by the Pope and King Philip IV in 1307, they fled to Scotland during the reign of Robert the Bruce, where they later to fall in the Battle of Bannockburn. After living in exile for many years, the Order later befriended a man named Henry Sinclair, the first Earl of Orkney, who was said to have later sailed through the Atlantic with the Templars and their vast horde of religious relics and treasures, settling them on the coastal regions of Canada, where they disappeared from the records of history. Think what you will about this legend, and it's important to note that at best, the history and connection is incredibly murky. But you've got to admit, there is something strangely fitting about the hooded figurine, isn't there? Next up at number two, the Bell Witch. Perhaps one of the most renowned and haunting tales of the historical American South. In fact, the legend of the Bell Witch is perhaps one of the most notorious paranormal instances of American folklore, in the story of a malevolent spirit that tormented a Tennessee home over 200 years ago. In 1804, a man named John Bell and his family settled on 300 acres of land, which is now known as Adams, Tennessee. Here they built a homestead living relatively successfully off the land for over a decade, but in the summer of 1817, things started to change. Change. At first, it was odd noises, strange pounding of doors, slaps on the walls, the eerie rattling of chains. Sometime later, John Bell himself discovered an odd creature out in the fields, a strange hybrid of a dog, a rabbit, and something not quite natural. Soon enough, blankets began getting pulled from beds in the dead of night. People were getting scratched, kicked, and their hair twisted and pulled. The spirit soon identified itself to the family as the Bell Witch, a malevolent spirit that offered many explanations to who and what she was, all of which served to confuse things further. In some cases, she said her name was Kate Batts and had been wronged by John Bell in her former life. In others, she claimed to be an ancient American spirit whose burial mound had been disturbed by the family. Either way, the Bell Witch legend gathered so much notoriety that General Andrew Jackson himself paid the residents a visit, where on arrival his horse and wagon suddenly froze on the threshold of the Bell property. His horses strained tirelessly to pull the wagon, but to no avail, before Jackson himself cried out, that must be the Bell Witch, and as legend goes, he heard a woman's voice whisper that they could then pass freely as they'd already amused her enough. Whatever the case, the cause of the Bell's torment over 200 years ago remains a complete and utter paranormal mystery, wrapped up in a terrifying and mystifying historical account of the paranormal. Maybe we'll never know, and it's probably for the best that we never do, isn't it? And finally, coming in at our number one spot, the starving time. 
And the fact of the matter remains, we have to end this particular historical list with one of the most violent, desperate and gruesome instances in colonial American history. Now in the early years of the continent settlement, they were trying times nonetheless and for the first outpost of Jamestown, Virginia, the colonists there tried desperately to carve some semblance of life in order to survive in the new world. For years though, there have been whispered through legend that the earliest American colonists had survived the harshest of conditions by turning to desperate measures, eating dogs, cats, rats, snakes, even shoe leather to stave off starvation. But as historians discovered in 2012, things were much, much worse than that and after unearthing a hastily constructed burial pit of a 14 year old girl, the first concrete evidence of cannibalism was discovered, leading to many later subsequent discoveries and the stark realization that the Jamestown settlers turned to cannibalism just to survive. Historians have traced back the bleak passage of history to one particularly deadly winter, a period known as the starving time that happened in Jamestown between 1609 and 1610, where settlers arrived during the worst drought in 800 years, catastrophically bringing fatal food shortages for the 6,000 or so people that lived in the Virginian settlement at the time. As history has found, it was a period of complete and utter misery, as the settlers were forced to dig up corpses from their graves in an attempt to eat when there was nothing else left. In one case documented by the colony's most famous leader, Captain John Smith, one man murdered his pregnant wife in an attempt to salt and eat her, who was later executed by the settlers and presumably he was eaten too. Yeah, it's probably best that we just end this one here.